All righty. Well, howdy, everyone, and good evening. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight as we discuss mining in South Carolina and some of the on-the-ground effects happening in Horry County. I'm going to give the other panelists a, a quick second to turn on their cameras so you can see them. Perfect. Um, well, I'm Marley Egger and I'm the Land, Water and Wildlife Project Manager with the Coastal Conservation League. And I'm joined tonight by presenters, Kara Sheldnick, the Wa Waccamaw River Keeper with Woodyaw Rivers Alliance, Trapper Fowler, our North Coast Project Manager with the Coastal Conservation League. And hopefully um, our Horry County resident, Hunter Edge, will be joining us shortly. And we're also joined by Emily Nellermo, the no North Coast Lawyer with the South Carolina Environmental Law Project, who will help us answer some questions for the Q&A. And so a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, this presentation is going to last around like 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have time at the end for you to ask all the panelists questions. Um, if you're attending, you'll be muted, but throughout, please uh, feel free to use that Q&A button and submit questions um, that we'll answer at the end of the presentation. And just as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and we'll send it out afterwards um, to everyone who registered. And so with that, thank you all for joining us and uh, let's dig right in. All righty. So I'm gonna be spending a little bit of time kind of going over um, what and where mining is and, and touch on the statewide concerns and efforts before we hear about the Horry County local rollbacks and the threats to Lewis Ocean Bay and then hear Hunter's personal story. So starting out with the most basic of questions, you know, what is mining? I think that when most people hear mining, um, what first comes to mind is probably like a coal mine or maybe even like this intricate tunnel system underground. Um, but what we have here in South Carolina is something that is completely different. In South Carolina, we mine for granite, limestone, shale, um, and even gold. But by far the most common type mined here and, and really all over the world um, is sand. And even if you don't think about this grainy stuff, you use it daily. You're watching this off something made with sand through a screen that is made with sand, surrounded by buildings made with concrete, which is 75% sand. And sand is a non-renewable resource. And the process of extraction permanently disrupts the landscape. It can destroy wetlands and wildlife habitat. And the associated discharges can pollute and degrade nearby water bodies. But this is not just a matter of ecological impacts. Over the last 20 years, the number of mines in South Carolina has gone up by 35%, but the laws and the regulations haven't kept up with the pervasiveness. After water, sand is actually our most used natural resource. We even use it more than oil. Yet this massive industry is often forgotten and one that is more common in afterthought. Most people don't even think about sand mining until one shows up in their backyard and by that time it's too late. But we believe that governments, regulators and planners need to start thinking about sand more proactively before people and other natural resources start feeling the impacts. This way we can provide certainty to communities and to operators because right now the industry is all but left to regulate itself. So there are actually over 500 active mines in South Carolina um, with the most common type, as I mentioned, is sand used for construction or industrial uses. And so this is a screenshot from the SC Active Mine Viewer, which is managed by DHEC. And we will put in the chat shortly a link that way you can access the Active Mine Viewer and look around there for yourself to see how many mines are near you. Um, but as you can see, there are mines that are distributed all throughout the state. There are some granite and vermiculite, you know, in the upstate, that's the, the blue and the dark yellow dots. Um, shale is kind of scattered in there, like that's the green. But if you look at the, the low country at our coastal zone, it's pretty clear that sand mining is what dominates that region. And using data from the SC Active Mine Viewer, we were able to calculate that nearly half of all active sand mines in South Carolina are found in our coastal zone. And of that, Horry County has the most mines with 55 active mines. And these are just active mines. They're not the ones that were previously mined and reclaimed. It's the ones that are allowed and are digging out sand right now. And so that's a little bit about where mines are. 
Um, but how do you get a sand mine? How, how do they pop up? So in order to get a sand mine, an operator needs authority from the local level through zoning, approval and permits um, from the state, and then occasionally federal approval as well, but there are loopholes for the industry. Um, but at the state level, you know, sand mining is governed by the SC Mining Act, and it's regulated by uh, DHEC, the Department of Health and Environmental Control. Operators can apply for either a, a general mine permit, which is anything that is five acres or less, or an individual mine permit, which is anything greater than that. And so general mines exist or general permits exist throughout the regulatory realm. Um, they're not something that is just for mining and they were created for efficiency. They were designed for a quick response to non-controversial projects to prevent well-meaning individuals from going through this longer um, you know, public process that companies and corporations need to go through for larger um, disruptive projects. However, in mining, we've noticed a concerning trend about the abuse of this permit. Um, that's because, because they were created for efficiency, general permits do not go up on public notice. And so that means at the state level, there's no notification requirement. And you can quite literally wake up to mining happening adjacent to your property. And you'll hear later from an Horry County resident who experienced just that. And this is problematic because most of the time, sand is not staying on that site. And five acres isn't the end of the mine or how large it's actually going to be. Operators often go back and apply afterwards for an individual permit, looking to expand. And that can be expanding to 30 acres or to 100 acres or, or even 500 acres. But by then, the damage has been done and precedent has been set for the site. And that's before any public input, input was taken into consideration, at least at the state level. But an individual permit, you know, is not the answer to everything under the current system. Um, it has its downfalls as well. Uh, while this permit type does afford the public input, uh, a crucial piece of this is that when evaluating a permit application, DHEC cannot consider the quality of life impacts from an operation. This means that right now, they can't deny a permit because of the impact it's gonna have on a nearby road or because of the noise or, or, or the dust. DHEC can really only consider factors as directed by the SC Mining Act, which hasn't been updated since the 90s. And so, you know, this, this isn't ideal for anyone. It leaves applicants frustrated from uncertainty, uh, DHEC faced with hearing concerns without having the power or the tools to address them, and residents facing their communities being dug out one truckload at a time. And so last year, we actually saw legislation that was the first of its kind to try and mediate some of these concerns and impacts. H3892 was introduced by Representative Richie Yao and supported by Representatives um, Hewitt, McGarry, Smith, Jefferson, Wetmore, and Danning. And for that, we thank them. And the premise of this bill was simple. There should be space between where people live and work and, and recreate and, and where these disruptive processes like mining can occur. Unfortunately, H3892 was ultimately held in House Committee and it did not progress. However, the, the concept behind the bill is still, still rings true and, and it's needed. Establishing reasonable space between places we live and play and sensitive areas with disruptive industrial processes is kind of common sense. And it would create a, a consistent uniform that brings some quality of life reassurance to communities and regulatory certainty to operators, having the potential to decrease the common conflicts that we see when a community and a mine collide. Because we know that this is not just a problem in Horry County, but that communities all over the state are feeling the impacts right now. We know that already stressed rural infrastructure is being overloaded with these heavy haul trucks that residents who grew up accustomed to a quiet rural way of life are left battling with speeding haul trucks and worrying about the safety of their kids walking to school or riding a bike with their friends. Mines are fragmenting communities and leaving them with nothing more than holes in the ground. And the Mining Act does not need to be completely overhauled in order to have some meaningful enforceable impact and for residents to get some relief. H3892, I think kind of demonstrates that, but what it is clear is that we do need the laws to keep up with the pervasiveness of the industries they regulate and mining is long, long overdue. 
And now I'm going to pass this off to your Waccamaw Riverkeeper, Kara, to talk more about Horry County and the fallout from eliminating local oversight. Thank you. Hey y'all, um, I apologize for the ringing behind me. I share an office. Um, I'm Kara Schultnick. I am your Waccamaw River Keeper with Winyard Rivers. And it's my job to protect clean water in uh, the Waccamaw River watershed. Um, and part of that is dealing with issues around mining. So, in Horry County specifically, mining activity has changed dramatically in the past couple years. Before 2020, mining activity was allowed only as conditional uses in some zoning districts. Um, rezoning was required to allow those mining operations in other zoning districts. So if it wasn't already zoned for mining, it had to be rezoned. That meant that it came up in public hearing, the community could be involved and the community could have their say about whether or not they wanted this area to be rezoned to allow mining in their backyards. So mining operations were required to apply for a permit through the county in order to operate and rezonings often had to happen for that. However, um, following, I don't know if I, Okay, there we go. <laughs> so following 2020, um, Horry County lost a lawsuit in reference to a mining permit. Um, they had denied the permit for the Red Bluff mine due to a lot of community outcry, which was really important. It was amazing to see the community come out and really make that impact and voice their concerns and have this turned down. But the mining operators sued the county and the county lost. Rather than going back and looking at how the county lost this lawsuit, they decided that it would be best just to remove all ordinances regulating mining from the county. So now there is no regulation at the county level. There is only the state. Um, and there are currently 55 mines, like Riley said, operating in Horry County with permits from the state agency. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of oversight because there aren't a lot of people to see that. So why do we even mine in Horry County? As Riley mentioned, a lot of the things that are being mined are limestone and sand. Um, and since 2001, an estimated, this should say 100,039, 139 people. So um, 100, almost 140,000 people have moved to Horry County. Um, and with that growing population, there requires more residential development and more road construction. And a lot of that relies on sand. So to have the sand mined locally reduces costs for development and makes it more affordable for people to move here. So mining locally in Horry County benefits that growth that's going on. And there's no stopping that growth at this point. Um, we're gonna continue to see that through the next, however long people survive in Horry County. Um, I wanted to point out that the county has a comprehensive plan. It's called Imagine 2040, and this envisions the next 20 years of Horry County's growth and how that growth can be done sustainably and safely. And one of the big things Imagine 24 recognized was this quote here, which is from their um, county resources uh, portion of the Imagine 2040 plan. It says, as more people continue to locate to and visit the Grand Strand, it will be more important than ever to ensure that development occurs in a manner that promotes a high quality of life while protecting and enhances the unique resources. So the county and the people who worked on this plan recognized that we have a lot of really unique resources in our area. As you can see from this map, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of wetlands, and there's a lot of natural areas that we need to protect to make sure that our county has resources for those people who are moving here. Um, and mining is one way that we can impact those resources and negatively impact our quality of life here. So some mining impacts, um, uh, you'll notice that these are very diverse. They have a lot to do with just the environment that is being impacted. 
Air pollution obviously is a big one. We'll probably hear more about that from our local resident. They have experienced that air pollution, um, but also surface water and groundwater pollution. And Trapper uh, Fowler is gonna focus a little bit more on the habitat destruction and why the edge road mine is so bad for, for that impact, but also sinkholes. Um, we have, karst geology here and as we pump groundwater out to do these mining operations we can see sinkholes result in that i know that people in ori county have seen these sinkholes pop up but also issues with flooding and climate change and we'll get into those a little bit more in the next couple slides so what are quality impacts as your waccamaw river keeper my goal is to make sure that we have swimmable fishable, drinkable water in the Waccamaw River. We already have one case study of how mining impacts our water resources. There's a large mining operation in the Buck Creek watershed in Loris. Um, Buck Creek is a canaled swamp. And because of that, there isn't the swamp surrounding the, the original swamp that there used to be. It's basically a glorified ditch that runs down to the river from up towards Loris and Longs. And this canal swamp or Buck Creek has had continual and repetitive 303D listings for impaired waters. And what that means is that the water is impaired, it's dirty, it's not good enough by state standards. And some of those things that they're seeing are increased bacteria, increased turbidity, um, increased runoff, and mining can lead to these issues with this increased runoff, despite the stormwater regulations that are in place to regulate these mines and their discharges, we're still seeing impacts from the mining that's already existing in Horry County. And not only is this bad for the plants and animals that call the river home, we get a lot of our drinking water from surface water in this area. So if our natural waterways are impaired, then we're gonna have issues with making sure that we have clean water to drink. And if it takes more to remove those pollutants, guess what's gonna happen to your water bill? Water bills are gonna start to climb and we're just not gonna have access to clean water. So this is one really great example of what's already happened with a mine in Horry County and how that can lead to increased problems with water quality. Flooding is another big issue for Horry County. You know, right now we're in a drought, the river is low, we're looking good going into hurricane season, but it wasn't too long ago that the river rose, it flooded roads and um, a lot of people lost their homes and their belongings and it was just really awful. Um, mines are often promoted as a flood mitigation benefit so they say, oh, we're digging this great big pond. There's more room for the water to go. Uh, you've seen pictures of mines. There's already water in the ponds. And once it's done, then you have a lake left over. And that lake's already full of water. So what now happens is you don't have a reservoir. where you have destroyed the natural habitat that would typically absorb that. You know, sand is very absorbent. That's where floodwaters need to go into that sand, into those wetlands. And as we continue to develop them and to mine them, we actually lose the natural ability of our landscape to absorb floodwaters and to slow and spread and soak as those floodwaters come downstream. So rather than creating mitigation, um, we've destroyed mitigation and we've thus created a risk for us. And additionally, if those mines flood, you know, if there's suspended particles, if it's being fed by groundwater, you're going to see issues with conductivity. Um, there are a lot of issues that can come from flooding a mined area, like these mines that we're seeing in Horry County. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on the importance of our wetlands. Um, a lot of the areas that are mined are also either in our wetlands or very close to our wetlands. Um, the mine that we're going to talk about today is right on the edge of Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. And I'm not going to step on Trapper's toes. We're going to let him talk about that. But I just wanted to point out that 
our county is covered with wetlands and they are being continuously filled, ditched and channelized. And as we continue to do that, we lose our natural ability to filter water, to mitigate flooding and to protect those natural resources that are so important to everyone in the county. Um, whether you're using it for fishing and recreation or you just like to go out and see the river or our wetlands, or if you're getting your drinking water from our surface waters. Everyone is impacted by this. And our Carolina Bays are one of the most heavily mined areas. Um, they have that beautiful sand around the edges that's great for mining. And in 1991, which is quite a while ago, y'all, like 31 years ago, um, a study in South of South Carolina's Carolina Bays, there's a tongue twister for you, more than 80 of the Carolina, 80% of the Carolina Bays in the state were determined to be disturbed, 80% already. So we have these really unique natural places that are so special to the Carolinas. And already 30 years ago, 80% of them had already been disturbed. And now it looks like we're not learning from the past and doing the same thing. So um, to talk a little bit more about our Carolina Bays, I'll let Trapper take over and explain why this is so important. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Trapper Fowler. Um, before joining the Coastal Conservation League, I managed Lewis Ocean Bay for six years as a DNR wildlife biologist and also the burn balls, uh, coordinating all the prescribed burns on the property. You know, Lewis Ocean Bay is unique per conservation lands in that it's surrounded by urban interface, you know, heavy development, Myrtle Beach, Conway, Highway 90, 2231 highways. There's constant external threats uh, from all directions in all shapes and sizes. And this includes encroaching housing developments, new phases being built out every day, um, a proposed hospital across the street from inter on International Drive that will uh, make prescribed burning more difficult, if not impossible. And then this sand mine that poses uh, hydrological concerns and changes to the wetlands in the Carolina Bays, noise and air pollution, and other health risks to both the recreationalists that use this property and the wildlife that call the preserve home. So Edge Road Mine is, is situated on the border of Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. You may hear me uh, call Lewis Ocean Bay LOB for short. Uh, but it's a it's a sensitive and an endangered ecosystem. And why why is this mine a problem? Well, you know, changes in hydrology could equal increased wildfire risk because of draining down those um, those soils and, and that vegetation. Um, certainly loss of habitat, loss of wetlands uh, for species that depend upon those noise and air pollution, and then you know, long-term presence of heavy machinery where wildlife is abundant, some of which are threatened, endangered, and rare, could, could all equal negative impacts. Uh, but before getting into these details, let's first dive into some of the background information about LOB and, and how prescribed fire today plays a role in maintaining the habitat and protecting the urban interface nearby. Lewis Ocean Bay is globally significant. Why? Well, it's home to globally imperiled species uh, like the Venus flytrap. They, they only occur here in Horry County, uh, more specifically on Lewis Ocean Bay that's being managed, you know, a stable population. And then just outside of Wilmington, that's it for the entire world. Um, of the 76 heritage preserves in the state, this one has the most biological diversity. Fire is the key, prescribed fire today, is the key to that unique diversity. Fire removes the brushy vegetation and allows rare plants and animals to thrive in the understory. And, and in turn, prescribed fire reduces fuels for wildfires, so it decreases that risk. Lewis Ocean Bay is home to our black bears. Uh, the Carolina Forest and, and Highway 90 area used to have the most robust bear population in the state. This is no longer due to habitat uh, for uh, habitat loss from development. And then, of course, the Carolina Bays. Much of Horry County used to be 
impenetrable Carolina bays and swamps. Uh, it was one of the last counties to be inhabited on the coast because of this terrain. Um, many of the bays today have been drained or destroyed by development um, or you know, agriculture. So Lewis Ocean Bay is a remnant of what Horry County once was with 23 intact Carolina bays that are protected in perpetuity. Uh, these bays provide many ecosystem services to us humans uh, in the form of water storage during large storm events that we know will increase with a changing climate, water filtration, erosion control, habitat for threatened and endangered rare species, and of course, uh, denning sites for our coastal black bear. Animals and plants included depend on these wetlands to be wet, all are part of their life cycle. This is why potential changes in hydrology is a problem from a proposed mine project next door. And just for those of you that don't know what a Carolina Bay is, you can see the north arrow here on the right. All of these Carolina Bays, when you look at an aerial, is, you know, they're all oriented in the same direction, this northwest to southeast um, orientation with a sand rim primarily on that southeast corner, but sometimes they encircle the entire bay. And they all have that elliptical shape, um, you know, the egg shape. So that's how you can tell it's a Carolina Bay and not just a, a depressional wetland. Uh, so why is fire so crucial? Uh, why do we need to continue burning on places like Lewis Ocean Bay? Well, plants like Venus flytraps and animals like red cockaded woodpeckers evolved with natural lightning fires. Native Americans studied these fires and then used fire as a tool to manage the forest for their benefit. Um, natural fires are not a part of the landscape anymore because we humans suppress those fires today to protect our infrastructure, our homes and our schools, et cetera. Uh, but like Native Americans, we are using prescribed fire today uh, to manage the forest and to replicate those lightning fires. Without some type of fire on the landscape, species like Venus flytraps and red cockaded woodpeckers disappear uh, forever. But just after the fire can look pretty grim to some folks, you know, you have this black ground, but the forest really does uh, rebound very, very quickly. Plants like these pitcher plants, another carnivorous plant, um, and animals return within days. Uh, wild turkey will be in this unit within hours scavenging for insects. And of course the goal, you know, after the prescribed fire application is an open park-like pine savanna. Um, th this is like four to six months after the fire. Uh, fire maintained ecosystems are very diverse, especially in the understory. It rivals that of a tropical rainforest on a per unit basis. Of course, fire promotes unique plants like these. Many of these plants also depend on a specific moisture level in their habitat. This is why changes in hydrology is so worrisome. Fire is crucial for our game species. Routine fire increases nutritional content and palatability of the forest foods. And in reference to the mine, you know, hunters, uh, hunters and, and recreationals, but specifically hunters here, spend a lot of time and effort scouting out a place to hunt. Um, you know, it, my, me, myself as a hunter, if I hiked in an hour before sunrise and before that I'd spent months scouting out a perfect place to put my deer stand, I hike in early one morning to sit in my tree stand. And then as day breaks, all, all I hear is, is dump truck racket and heavy machinery noise. I would be very upset. This is a public property. That's what this, this place is for, is for recreation, um, and, and wildlife. So, you know, and, and hunters don't just go into the woods to harvest an animal. They, we go into the woods to, to watch and listen the natural, uh, natural world wake up um, and, and, and find some peace and solitude. We know that fire is not only needed in the uplands, but research tells us the wetlands, including the Carolina Bays, need fire just as much. But you know, Lewis Ocean Bay is already extremely difficult to burn uh, without any new challenges. 
due to its location and these factors listed here. And for example, if peat soils, which are found in those Carolina bays, are dry and fires introduced, then these areas can burn and smolder for three to four months and then pop back out of, uh, and, and cause a wildfire. So drying of our soils and wetlands um, you know, equates to additional complications for prescribed burn planning for folks like South Carolina DNR and Forestry Commission. Um, you know, this is, this is what a, a prescribed fire looks like under the right conditions, the, the correct weather parameters, you know, uh, by a trained professional, uh, a burn boss, an average of two to six foot flame lengths, um, but you still get some pretty large smoke plumes, but it's nothing compared to a devastating wildfire like you see here. Uh, this was the 2009 Highway 31 fire. This fire is in the crown of the trees. Uh, this is very different than a prescribed fire. Uh, it jumped all these lanes of traffic, went into barefoot landing and burnt uh, around 80 homes. It's not a matter of if this happens again, it's a matter of when. This is a wildfire prone area of the state with a rich wildfire history. Uh, and we know that these wildfires will likely increase with a changing climate. So what can we do? Well, the, the, our best defense is prescribed burning. Um, this is a great example, this picture before you. On the left, you have the mitigation bank today um, that was not burned before the wildfire in 2009. On the right, you have Lewis Ocean Bay that was burned two months prior to the wildfire. You can see the boundary paint there on the trees. Um, you know, there's no needle scorch on the right. There's no dead trees on the right in this area of the preserve because DNR had prescribed burn in this area. This is a great example of why Lewis Ocean Bay needs to be burned regularly and why we need to advocate, advocate for smart development near this preserve so that DNR doesn't have any more challenges to tackle. Uh, more challenges equals less burning. But back to the edge mine and some of the background here. This started as a five acre mine, 20 feet in depth under a general permit, which you know, we, we as the public don't receive notice of this but because it's under five acres. Now it's proposed to enlarge to 23 acres in size and 50 feet in depth under an individual permit. It's common to see these small mines use this route to later enlarge. I think Riley mentioned that earlier. Uh, surveys were conducted in early July in 2021 uh, by the mine um, to address concerns uh, uh, from DNR that wrote a letter uh, of concerns about the mine next door. Um, when they went out to do this biological assessment in the mine, they found two red cockaded woodpeckers on the mine site. Uh, these are listed as endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and under the Mining Act, you cannot mine where threatened and endangered species exist. And this is a great example of how animals do not know property lines. Uh, this is why it truly does matter what occurs next door to our conservation lands. The mine conducted reptile surveys during this time as well uh, for spotted turtles, uh, as well as southern hognose snake, but it was the wrong time of the year. Um, and, and this is all called out in DNR's letter as well. Um, the site was also documented to be in drought at this time. So both of these issues uh, may have skewed their findings uh, of these species. Uh, you, like I said, you can find all this in, in DNR's letter from, from March 17th, 20, uh, 2021, uh, 2022 uh, on the DHEC website. We, we have caught this operator mining without a permit twice and alerted DHEC. Uh, we've had to ask them to reinstall their silt fence on at least one occasion. That's, that's put there to keep animals out. All this to say there's been holes in this mining project from the beginning. Environmental impacts, you know, changes in hydrology that I've mentioned. This, this could, you know, draining of the wetlands in the Carolina Bays could alter habitat for threatened endangered species, including the Venus flytrap, amphibians, reptiles, um, they depend on these wetlands, like I said, for all or part of their life cycle. If the mine does drain wetlands or Carolina bays, there's an increase in wildfire activity and wildfire risk. Drying of Pocosin vegetation and peat soils makes it more available to burn um, and could burn during the wrong time of year, um, wildfire season, when we're in a drought. 
Um, this is also could make more difficult fire planning for South Carolina DNR. You know, as a burn boss myself, you know, we depend on bays and wetlands to be wet when it rains, but you can't predict moisture content of a wetland or a bay that's being altered from an external threat like a mine next door. It's impossible. And while I can't say excavation of a 50 foot deep mine will impact the hydrology for sure, DHEC sure can't tell you that it won't. Um, studies need to be carried out. This needs to be looked into. We have anecdotal information of a mine draining a private pond across the street in the Charleston area. So it does happen. Lastly, there, there's carbonate sandy soils in this area and that has historically been um, a source of sinkholes in the Loris and North Myrtle Beach area. So this could pose a problem for both the preserve and surrounding landowners, especially folks that are on well water. Um, South Carolina DNR, the natural resource experts in our state have these same concerns all addressed in their letter. Direct health impacts, you know, pics, these are pictures from our trail camera that has been vandalized once and, and now has gone mis you know, missing. Um, but it was on Lewis Ocean Bay facing the mine. You just can't make out the, the heavy machinery in the background uh, beyond the trees there. But you know, noise pollution has the potential to interrupt wildlife breeding, nesting, uh, feeding, rearing young. You know, predators need stillness in the forest to hunt. Mothers need to hear their young. Uh, during breeding season, mates need to be able to hear each other's calls. Uh, a mine is a long-term project that will impact the forest and all of its inhabitants for years, not months. Um, you have loss, potential loss of hunting and birding opportunities for recreationalists. Uh, recreationalists will have to deal with dust inhalation. Um, and, and then, of course, you, you run the risk of entrapment of animals in a 50-foot deep pit. And in closing, I just want to mention that Lewis Ocean Bay is South Carolina's best assemblage of Carolina bays. These Carolina bays are not protected currently um, under uh, the Clean Water Act, but they are protected under the Heritage Trust program within DNR and inside the boundary lines of this preserve. Yet here we are, and we need your help to protect this special natural resource from an external threat, the, the Edge Road Mine. Um, up next, you'll hear from Hunter Edge on impacts to his family and his home site as a neighboring property owner to this mine. I thank you very much for your time. Hey y'all, I'm Hunter Edge, uh, resident of Edge Road. I guess it's only fitting that we're all having technical difficulties here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, my wife and I, uh, we live on Edge Road, uh, probably about from the proposed mine site, probably about 150 to 200 yards. I just kind of want to give you all a little bit of background and some of our concerns um, with regards to being a resident of the road and just in general. Um, currently, Edge Road is about a three mile coquina uh, dirt road that um, has prescriptive use easements for resident residential living as well as agricultural. Um, my family is here fifth generation. Um, the mine itself proposes a lot of other issues and really just concerns um, that myself and my, my wife and family have. Um, the first thing I guess with DHEC is that there when the mining originally started, they began as a 4.3 acre mine. And due to the size of that mine, there was no prior notification given to any of the residents of the home or any people to um, maybe kind of, maybe who would want to oppose it or have some type of uh, voice against it. So with regards to that, we woke up uh, with, I know Trapper had mentioned on noise pollution. I don't even need a, an alarm clock anymore because when the trucks are going by my house at probably between 6 and 6.30 in the morning, the house is shaking, the windows are rumbling, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, and currently, these trucks are being dispatched because they are not mining without loads. 
I, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't even know how to even describe the amount of noise and vibration, et cetera, that a truck coming in and leaving with a loaded of mine sand would be. Um, another issue is trespassing. Uh, as you can see on the picture to the right, um, their equipment that they're bringing in with their low boys, with the excavators, et cetera, is really taking up the road. Like I said, it was a, it's a narrow dirt road that really is not conducive to a mining operation. Um, it's causing other residents of the road to trespass and you, I'm, I'm sure they feel very uncomfortable with it, but just because it's either do that or run into a uh, stormwater drainage ditch. Um, with regards, you know, again, to maybe the picture on the left, um, and it's just one of many, one of many videos, just the amount of dust that's kicked up from the road. And it's, it's not the truck, it's not a residential truck that's creating that amount of dust. It's a, again, an empty dump truck that's coming in or going out. How much more will that increase once they are actually hauling a payload? But again, you know, all that being said with regards to the road not being fit uh, to actively, you know, um, withstand that type of use on day to day. Here's a perfect example coming from a view from our front porch with our pecan tree to the right. If you are an oncoming car, you're A, either trespassing or B, you're going to have a head on collision with the dump truck. And uh, that's obviously not going to end well for anybody. Um, but I kind of really want to more so focus in on uh, just the home life in general. My wife and I, we moved down here again, fifth generational as a quiet, very, very small piece in the country to raise our family and, and enjoy the, the life that I, you know, that I grew up with. Um, right now, again, if you can look at the slide just to the left of that dump truck, we probably have 15-ish blueberry, um, blueberry bushes that my kids love to go and pick. Uh, used to, you could walk right out there and not have an issue. Now, you know, A, it's completely unsafe, and B, I couldn't tell you how many times that it, my wife more so than myself has, you know, heard them complain about the amount of dust in their eyes and stuff like that. And again, this is not the same amount of dust that your average truck residential car is kicking up. Um, you can see in the, on the picture there, you can very faintly see, very faintly see the dump truck. And if there was a car coming in behind them or another dump truck, you definitely wouldn't be able to see. Them. Um, but just on another note, just kind of speaking long term, uh, just due to our proximity to the road, I think everybody who moves down a dirt road will, you know, uh, there are potential maybe health risks with regards to normal traffic, uh, just the, you know, inhaling the dust. And I think people who people who sign up to live on a dirt road will accept that. But this amount of dust is unacceptable because it's not what was signed up for, A, it's not what the road was intended to, B, and then C, again, it's not a, it, the road is not adequate for it. So long term, as long term, what's going to happen in five years when their proposed mine is supposedly quote unquote done? What long lasting impacts will that be? Not for myself or my wife, but my kids who are six, four, and one and a half. The other residents of the road who also have various children. Um, my wife and I, everybody that lives on the road is opposed to it, again, for a lot of the same reasons that I mentioned. Um, and they have kids as well. So what's Edge Road going to look like after the mine? And then even further gone than that, what's their lives going to look like when they're our age? or older, um, there's been a lot of uh, issue, well, I can say a lot of issues yet because the mine hasn't officially taken off, but a lot of voices and concerns to me, uh, 
Everybody on edge road is on well water. Everybody's on septic tank. What's going to happen with, you know, A, the wells drying up, B, maybe just various different types of sediment pollutions in a, you know, intruding in the well, and also, again, septic tank issues. Um, I think long-term edge road mine cannot happen. And the reason I say that specifically is that if you look at the DHEX mission statement, who are the people who's approving or disapproving their mind, and I quote, this is their published mission statement, to improve the quality of life for all South Carolinians by protecting, promoting the health of the public and the environment. And in my opinion, if this mine gets approved, by DHEC, who that's their published mission statement, they're, they're, they're avoiding their mission statement because it's not only that they're uh, going against a little bit of it, they're going against their whole mission statement. Um, again, I want to thank everybody that's facilitated this for me and that's invited my, you know, give myself a voice as well as my wife and family and other residents of the road. Um, but also, you know, I think this is a bigger issue, not just Edge Road, because again, you know, I'm here talking to y'all, but it could just as easily be another family down the road when the next mining site is proposed and opened, and then the same issues are occurring and reoccurring and reoccurring. Yeah, thank thank you so y'all much. again for everything. I do appreciate, I do appreciate y'all having me, you know. No, thank you so much, Hunter, for joining us and for being willing to, to share your story. Um, like you said, like this is not something that's only happening in Horry County. It's happening to um, people all over the state, but we appreciate you um, being willing to uh, share your story with us today. Riley, I see a question um, that I might be able to answer um, about how often water quality is tested around Lewis Ocean Bay. Um, that's a really great question. We test on the Waccamaw River uh, twice a month through our volunteer monitoring program. And then the Environmental Quality Lab at CCU tests on the off weeks. Um, so we have a couple sampling sites nearby. We sample at Reeves Ferry and Starrett Swamp. So not directly um, at Lewis Ocean Bay, but we also work with South Carolina Adopt a Stream to help um, kind of fill in the missing gaps, if if I might say, uh, to get some other sampling locations. So if anybody is interested in um, participating or being a volunteer monitor, we will give you all the training we know. Um, or all the all the training you need to know, um, and able to go to enable you to go out and sample. And Trapper is actually one of our sample samplers. So um, feel free to reach out to me if you want to get involved or if you have questions about water quality. And Kara, do you mind answering the next question of how how do we expect the proposed sand mine to affect water quality? Sure. Yeah. So. I would expect that there's going to be increased issues with turbidity. Um, we're gonna end up seeing runoff from that mine one way or the other, whether it's from the trucks that are blasting down Hunter's Road, um, leaving you know, particles behind that after stormwater runoff, they're gonna end up in the river. So anytime we're disturbing the sediments around in our watershed, we're gonna see increased turbidity from stormwater runoff. And the other unfortunate side of that is that um, turbidity and suspended, so turbidity is how clear the water is. And if it's real murky and there's a lot of suspended particles like sediments and stuff in there, um, you're not gonna be able to see through the water as well. And even though our water is dark, uh, we color is different from turbidity. Um, but the issues with that is you're going to have growth of plants that's going to be reduced. And then, of course, E. coli, our favorite little uh, fecal bacteria, loves to glom on to 
turbidity um, or suspended particles. And it makes it easier for it to survive because it has food and safety on those sediment particles. So some serious issues that we could see from mining. Thanks, Kara. And so we just got a question of um, how have the laws changed that are allowing wetlands to be altered and or filled in? Uh, this was not legal many years ago. Um, and I can respond to that. And then Emily also, if you have anything to add, um, but, but essentially the Clean Water Act is, our, is the staple piece of clean water legislation that governs all water bodies. And throughout the years, there's been um, differences in what uh, water bodies receive that kind of federal jurisdiction and what receives that kind of layer of extra protection. Um, so it's been it's been pretty ambiguous. And then some Supreme Court decisions actually ruled called it's called a Tolick rule. And that essentially said that if you scoop up sand in one go, then it's OK. If anything spills back, spills back over into that wetland, then it's considered um, needing to be a, a 404 permit or a federal uh, discharge permit. But right now, that's not the case. And we always see that because, as uh, Kara mentioned, they're going to be discharging this, this groundwater, this um, storm water into adjacent wetlands. And so um, we always see wetlands on site with mining operations. And, and Riley, if, if I might add, you know, that the Clean Water Act is not nearly as broad as, as it was once interpreted. It is open to interpretation. And a lot of the time, these wetlands that we know exist when there's water around, um, they're considered intermittent wetlands, especially our Carolina Bays. So our Carolina Bays, though they operate as wetlands a lot of the time, they're not protected under the Clean Water Act, which is really unfortunate. And can I make a, uh, a chime in again? I'm sorry for the non-video. Uh, just to piggyback on what Kara was saying to maybe elaborate a little bit with stuff that I've been reading with regards to turbidity. I don't, I only remember the acronym NTUs is how they measure turbidity, but isn't there a certain number of NTUs that once it's measured above that, it is now deemed, I, I don't know if it's uh, the words unsafe or. Uh, right, right. That, hazardous. Yes, that's correct, Hunter. Um, we, we term it as impaired which is what we've seen in the case study that we talked about a little bit earlier with the, the mining in Loris and Longs. We have impairments because of these water quality issues. And um, turbidity, while it's, it's maybe not the scariest one in terms of health, like you know, you're, you're not gonna get as sick from it if you're out in the river playing in it and it's turbid, um, but it does have a major effect on the life around the waters and in the waters as well. And on our drinking water. It's a big one. So one of the um, questions I've gotten a couple of times now is basically what can people do to help? Um, whether you live in Horry County or not, one thing that you can do to help is by attending the public hearing for Edge Road Mine. Um, we're going to be putting up details for that um, after the Q&A. It's going to be on uh, July 30th, and there is both a, or yes, July, June 30th, my apologies. And there's going to be both an in-person and a virtual option. Um, they're not taking uh, comments at that time, but the comment period is going to be extended through uh, July 15th. And so by attending that public hearing and learning more and making it known that you do care about the special place, you do care about Lewis Ocean Bay, um, it really, really helps. And then another thing that you guys can do is to make sure that you're signed up for uh, Waccamaw River Keeper, Scalp, and the Conservation League Action Alerts. Whenever something like this comes across our desk and it's a, it poses a major threat to the environment or to the quality of life of, of people, we get involved and we send out alerts to let people know and to get them engaged. And so make sure you're subscribed to our action alerts and following us on social media because we share a lot of good information there. Um, Riley, if I could just chime in, um, at the, the public hearing, they will be taking comments. They just won't be um, doing questions and answers. So if people wanna speak at 
the public hearing and they can do that or they can submit um, comments through the DHEC website. Um, and I'm sure you'll provide all that information, but I just wanted people to know that um, there's multiple ways that they can voice their comments through this, um, through the DHEC process. Thank you, Emily, I appreciate that. Let's see. Alrighty, I'm not seeing new questions right now. So Katie, I think you can go ahead and put up that information for the public hearing. Thank you so much, Emily, for, for clarifying and for um, apologies that I misspoke about the comments and the Q&A, but I am going to put a link in the chat right now for the public hearing where you can register. And really, really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties, but I hope that y'all follow along and stay engaged and attend the public hearing because it's important to make your voice heard. And can I, can I add one more thing to that? Of course. You know, I think I, I commend, you know, organizations like y'all of really spearheading this project, but with regards to the people listening, you can be on one side of the fence or other, however you want to slice or dice it. But at the end of the day, saying nothing is also saying something. But that's all. So get involved and make your voice heard. All righty. Well, thank you all for joining us today, and we will be sending out a recording to the webinar and some more information from, from Trapper's slides that he wasn't able to um, get through in a follow-up. But thank you all so much, and, and have a great evening.